Um, and Ashley, how about Completely you? Completely different. <laughs> <laughs> Not even close. <laughs> um, I do almost no research ahead of time. I write really humorous, zany mystery novels. Janet Ivanovich is very similar to how I write. Um, so I prefer to get the voice right, to get the humor right, and to just plow through that first draft as quickly as possible. It takes me about three months. And I do like to write in public. I cannot write that first draft at home. If I stay home, I'm unloading the dishwasher, I'm looking in the mirror and checking my teeth, I'm doing everything I can <laughs> right. think of other than actually sitting down to work. Um, but I have to do the second draft at home because I like to read it aloud. I read the entire book from beginning to end aloud. And Starbucks gets really unhappy with you, you know. I don't have a sword, but still. Um, so wherever research needs to be, there's big X's in my first draft. And I go back and fill that in later. And I find that it's really more efficient that way because once I've done several drafts, it turns out I didn't need that fact after all. Right. <laughs> so I can just throw those out. Are you part of any writers groups or any of that? Does that help or does that? Well, yes and no. Um, obviously, I'm a member of Sisters in Crime, and that's been really useful for all the really practical business side of writing. If you want to be a professional author and you need to know how to do your taxes and how to get an agent and how to work with your editor and how to handle rewrites and all those kinds of things, organizations like Sisters in Crime or Mystery Writers of America or Romance Writers of America are really places to get those questions answered. Um, Eric and I exchange our first drafts. So that's as much as a writer's group as I do. We hand them back and forth. And you really need someone, I think, who isn't your spouse or your mom, someone who it helps if they're a professional author who can say to you, look, I like you, but this, this is not working. And it's interesting that Eric was talking about Central Avenue. I was lucky enough to get to read that as he was writing it. And one of the hardest things I've ever had to do is turn to my friend Eric and say, the last third of your book doesn't work. <laughs> I hated her <laughs> and hated her terribly for about 20 minutes and right. then then kind of thought it over and realized she was right and um, you know we, we batted a few of my ideas back and forth and and finally I just sat down and rewrote the last third of the book and it's a much much better book because of it because well because she was mean to me <laughs> it's and true I, yeah. you need someone to who will be honest with you and say you know what and it's that person who isn't going to go to bed with you that night, who, you know, who isn't your mom, who, who isn't going to pat you on the shoulder and tell you it's okay, because your editor certainly isn't going to. So it's better to know it now <laughs> than to know it later. Yeah, I have a critique group, too, and they're, they're online only. And in fact, uh, it was only this last year that I met one of them face to face. I'd never spoken to them on the phone, never met them face to face, five years now running. And it was just, they were just virtual out in the ether. How did, how did that group come together? It was through Sisters at Crime. <laughs> really? That's I think this great. sound like a big commercial here, but <laughs> it was through the online group. There's an online group as well, uh, the Guppies, which are the great unpublished. And that's a separate chapter. It's an online chapter for those people who are trying to get published. And I put the call out there, hey, I'm looking for historical uh, mystery authors. I want to get together in a critique group. And I had been in face-to-face -face groups, and I really prefer the online group because um, you can look at it any time you need to, any time you want. Uh, if you have something fairly harsh to say, uh, you can have a lot of time to think about how you're going to phrase it. If they have something harsh to say back to you, you can swear and hit the furniture and then get back to the computer and say, well, okay, well, you have a very good point. <laughs> <laughs> so um, they've been very helpful in, in making sure everything goes well, everything makes sense, and you know, goes through them. It goes to my husband first, and then it goes to them, and then it goes to my agent. So there's a lot of people that have to go through and have their fingers in it just to get it polished up. It's so true when you say that, because I know, Eric, you've had mm. a similar situation, but it makes sense in your head. <laughs> yes, it's, oh, it's yeah. brilliant. Yes. Brilliant. But a lot of times, you know, particularly in a mystery novel where the plot tends to be rather complicated, it's easy to forget to tell your reader something mm -hmm. right. or to make a jump of logic that they have no reason to follow you. And you Connect don't the dots. Exactly. Yeah. And you don't realize that. Yeah. And, and you need someone to tell you. You need those other eyes. When you fall in love with your characters, and there's just certain things you do and don't want to do to them, uh, even the bad ones. In Living Room of the De Dead, I've 
got one of the most villainous characters I've ever written in my life. And I had initially planned to kill her off. By the end of the book, I couldn't bring myself to do it. So I made it kind of ambiguous as to what happened to her. I don't know that I'll ever bring her back, but you know, I, I just, she's I like, somewhere. she's alive somewhere. Was that you just know. a spoiler? No, <laughs> no. no, not really. No, just, Don't just worry. Wanted to make it's sure. not a spoiler. <laughs> just, no. just, just wanted. But to I did make have sure. one of my critique partners say, you know, I don't think Crispin would have said that, and so I had to look over that again and say, well, you know what, you're probably right. Let me pull back from that and and rework that. So, yeah, it's a very difficult process, I would think. I mean, for people who are critiquing other people's work, I mean. I was in a situation years ago where that's that was part of my responsibilities, and the things that you know we were taught or told to do was to make sure you always start off with something really positive. You know, I really love the way well, you said. <laughs> and when you, you get to know these people pink. very well, you don't you can sort of you dispense with that, that after a while. Yeah. But uh, my one of my big fantasies when, once I, I was published, you know, I was going to sit in my favorite chair and with my favorite cat and my favorite glass of wine and read my published book. But after it had been through everyone critiquing it, first my husband and then I made changes and then my partners, my, my critique partners and made changes and then my agent and then made changes and my editor and made changes and the copy editor and so on and so forth. By the time that book arrived on my doorstep, I didn't want to look at it anymore. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, you know, a few fantasies go by yeah. the wayside. <laughs> now, I once realized that on average, by the time a book of mine is published, I will have read the thing you know, a dozen or more times, or start more. to finish, and I'm I'm sick of it. <laughs> you know, I, I they're wonderful books. Don't get me <laughs> great, wrong. Great books. And everyone who buys them should buy another copy to reread the second time. There you time. go, but, and give it to people at Christmas, exactly. Thanksgiving, all But um, yeah, I I uh, I just want to move on to the next project at that right. point. Well, it's interesting what we were talking about early. All of us having been journalists, yes. I think when you've been professionally critiqued, it's a lot easier when you're working on your fiction. I mean, I have certainly been in a newsroom and had my editor screaming at me across 30 people. I had an editor who used to keep a water pistol in her desk. So wow. you get really used to taking criticism. And I think that for new writers starting out, that's one of the most difficult things to learn is that it's not personal and you have to develop a skin. And, and edit it. And just yeah. cut it because there's no more space. We've got to cut all this out. So exactly. I mean, you and you, you get, get used, used to that. that. Mm -hmm. I, I find that was one thing that really helped in writing books that a lot of younger writers who don't have a journalism background have problems with is y when you don't have a background in journalism you end up tweaking endlessly and and it mm -hmm. kills so many young writers with their first books they want to get everything absolutely perfect before they send it out to somebody and it's a huge mistake you're never going to get it absolutely perfect no matter what you know with any luck each book you write will be a bit better than the previous book and um, as a journalist, you don't have that luxury. You've got deadlines that you have to meet, and after that, even if you want to make it better, someone comes and snatches it off your desk. And I think uh, having a background in journalism helps with understanding that and not endlessly tweaking the stuff you're working on. And expanding on that is that I think that a lot of new writers never finish the book because they do what you're saying is they'll write chapter one 12 times. Mm -hmm. And the thing that you'll find if you come to a sister's meeting, the really experienced authors are going to tell you, write chapter one and never look at it until you get to the end of the book. The most important thing is to finish. Because you might write chapter one 12 times, then when you get to the end of the book, you've just figured out you don't need chapter one, and that thing you wrote 12 times is now in the trash can. There's no point. Finish the book. Don't you think? <laughs> that's, that's great advice. Yeah. And on that note, we're going to go to a quick break. When we come back, we'll be talking a little bit more about the business of writing mysteries and how that does work, whether it works, <laughs> <laughs> if you can make a living writing mysteries. Um, thanks so much. We'll be right back. <laughs> 